Do you know what the last Christmas was like in the Third Reich? Next, in this program, in addition to analyzing them in great detail, we will also see as an extra, what happened to the famous musicians who were playing in Berlin until the Red Army assault itself. Berlin, which only two years ago had become the capital of Europe due to the enormous German conquests, was at the end of 1944 in a situation of total devastation, and without any hope that the situation would improve. Instead, one could only hope that the brutal bombings would continue to increase in intensity, until finally the Americans or the Soviets stormed the city. Against this background, the emaciated inhabitants of Berlin had little or nothing to celebrate during the Christmas of 1944 that was to come. There was practically no one who had not lost a family member on one of the combat fronts, or who had a family member whose whereabouts were unknown. Furthermore, it was not only the combatants who died, but it was also the civilians themselves who died in thousands in each of the massive bombings. Although the German civilian population had not yet begun to suffer from hunger as such, the food they ate had been rationed for many months, and they were short of many foods. Gone were the years when everyone had a roast goose for dinner on Christmas night. The German news programs juggled to transmit messages of tranquility and hope to the population, in an attempt to make this endearing date help people in such difficult circumstances. The other side of some peaceful news with calm and pleasant images typical of Christmas was marked by the offensive in the Ardennes, that the Germans began on December 16. And it was precisely in this sector of the Ardennes on the Western Front, where all hopes had been placed to obtain a great victory, which would allow them to reduce the agony they experienced every day. German propaganda sold that this offensive would take the British and Americans out of the war, which would cause German cities to stop being brutally bombed. 1944 was the year in which all records for bombs dropped on Germany were broken with more than half a million tons of bombs, equivalent to more than 30 atomic bombs like the one dropped on Hiroshima. However, the illusion of this solution in the Ardennes did not last long because just a few days after the start of this offensive, news about the development of the operation stopped being broadcast. Everyone knew that the absence of news meant one thing, and that was that the offensive had failed, otherwise they would continue reporting on the progress. If the last big bet had failed, what could come next? Many Germans asked themselves. To prepare the country for the bad news of that moment, Joseph Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda and Information, had announced that Christmas 1944 would have to be celebrated with the greatest austerity possible, in solidarity with the soldiers fighting to defend the Reich. Among the population the prevailing mood was a combination of fatalism and repressed hysteria. The city of Berlin was dominated by an atmosphere of imminent collapse both in personal life and in the existence of the nation, and its inhabitants spent money without any moderation, knowing that it would soon lose all its value. However, high-quality products were only available to a few. The shortage of certain types of products had already begun at Christmas 1941, as a letter sent by Guderian's wife to her husband demonstrates. But because the senior officers had a very high salary, this shortage was not something that affected them. On the other hand, the water and electricity supply could be maintained, although it was continually cut off. Even so, in cities like Berlin, the electricity supply could be maintained until the Soviets assaulted the city in mid-April 1945. In any case, the millions of people who had already suffered damage to their homes to date had to illuminate with candles or lamps. The wife of a soldier who was on the Western Front wrote this letter to her husband at the end of 1944. The trams don't work, and it feels like a big plow has leveled the entire city. We have no water or electricity, and gas is constantly cut off. Food is also scarce and more and more people are getting sick. Candlelight can be very endearing at Christmas or at a romantic dinner, but living with it every day makes you feel great loneliness and sadness. My nerves are completely unhinged, and I can barely sleep. Another fact to highlight was that suicides had multiplied in the interior of Germany, and for many, that was the only escape they found from the agony that each day represented. As a curiosity, some public spaces such as the bathrooms of the air raid shelters had to be closed because many took advantage of this space to commit suicide. 
On the other hand, defeatist comments were becoming more and more frequent, and the German police began to turn a blind eye, because if they were taken seriously, there would not have been prisons for everyone. There was a particularly famous joke that spread throughout Germany during the Christmas of 1944 that went like this. This Christmas it was practiced, give a coffin. In this way, and while the Germans were preparing to spend what would be the worst Christmas of their lives, even more devastating news arrived. Without a doubt, it was not news that the German government transmitted, but in the end people ended up finding out by listening to foreign stations, or listening to what the soldiers said. The news in question was that Budapest was being attacked by the Red Army, and was about to be surrounded. At the end of October all the alarms had gone off after learning what had happened in the Prussian town of Nemersdorf, where the Soviets had tortured and massacred the entire civilian population. That this same event would occur in each of the German, or in this case Hungarian, cities, when the Soviets resumed their advance, was the greatest fear of the entire German civilian population. It was exactly on December 24, just a few hours before Christmas dinner, when Budapest was surrounded by the Red Army, and in some way, many felt that it was the prelude to what would happen in Berlin in a few months. Ultimately, Budapest was under siege for a month and a half, and its 800,000 civilians experienced even greater suffering than the Berliners. It was under these circumstances of suffering, austerity and uncertainty that Germans faced their last Christmas under the government of the Third Reich. The first days of 1945 would bring nothing but misfortune, when it was finally learned that the German offensive in the Ardennes had failed, and the Soviets began their attack on the Vistula, which caused an immense wave of refugees. These refugees soon began arriving in eastern Germany by the tens of thousands, carrying horrifying news of what was to come. So, by the end of January, just a month after the worst Christmas night of all, the Soviets were just 70 kilometers from Berlin. To this we must add another event that took place just a few days later, which was the most intense bombing that Berlin had suffered to date, to which we can also add that of Dresden. The one in Berlin took place on February 3, 1945, and the one in Dresden 10 days later. In the bombing of Berlin, as we saw recently in a program, 1,500 American bombers and 1,000 fighters participated, which caused more than 20,000 casualties in the civilian population of Berlin, and left 120,000 people homeless. On the other hand, nearly 2,000 bombers participated in the bombing of Dresden, causing between 25,000 and 40,000 deaths and an undetermined number of injuries. The news that the Germans spread after the attack stated that up to 200,000 people had died in Dresden. But as if the punishment of these bombings were not enough for the civilians, just a few weeks before Christmas, they had received the news that they had to enter the Volkssturm to actively fight against the Allied armies, and by the end of 1944 many of these men had already been mobilized. Having seen how bitter the last Christmas of the Third Reich was, let's analyze, as we announced at the beginning of the program, what happened to the musicians of the Berlin Philharmonic. This orchestra was made up of 105 musicians, who throughout the war had provided Berliners with pleasant nights of relief from fear and despair. Goebbels commented during those last weeks of the war that the Berlin Philharmonic concerts continued to have a very positive impact on the population, and it had to be maintained at all costs. At the end of March 1945, the orchestra gave a concert which, as almost always, was attended by Albert Speer, in which for the first time, the accumulated tension was evidently noticeable. It was on that occasion that one of the members of the orchestra called Taxner, who was also a friend of Albert Speer, asked the Minister of Industry to try to save them from the apocalypse that was to come. The greatest fear that some of these musicians had was being recruited into the Volkssturm and being mobilized for combat with the mission of defending Berlin, which they anticipated that the Soviets were about to attack. Mr. Minister, the violinist began. I want to talk to you about a very delicate matter. I hope you understand me. In these times it is difficult to talk about certain issues. Speer, then told him that he didn't have to worry about anything and that he could talk to him about any matter in any tone he wanted. When Taxner told him that the musicians did not want to go down with the city, Speer told him that he had already planned a plan to avoid it. <laughs> 
The only problem was that they had to continue giving between two and three concerts a week, and as is evident, his absence would be immediately noticeable. That is why they had to be evacuated just when the end came, taking advantage of the confusion. Otherwise, they would have been accused of treason and would have been persecuted by Goebbels or Himmler's men. Speer thought that the Americans would be the first to arrive in Berlin, since on the Western Front the German defense had collapsed a couple of weeks ago. In this way, his plan would consist of getting the musicians out of Berlin just when the Americans were less than a night away. On the other hand, if it was finally the Soviets who attacked Berlin first, he also planned to take them out and send them west with the Americans. But how would the musicians know when the time had come? The idea that Speer had was when he changed the musical program so that the last piece was Wagner's Twilight of the Gods, that would mean that the end had arrived and that the evacuation would occur at the end of the concert. This final concert took place on Thursday, April 12, just four days before Zukov and Konyev attacked the Oder River and the Nysa River. Thus, when the musicians were informed that they had to end the concert with the piece from the Twilight of the Gods, everyone knew that this would be their last concert. Albert Speer had organized everything so that some trucks would take them to about 400 kilometers southwest of Berlin, where the Soviets would never arrive, because the Americans were hours away from occupying that sector. However, when the moment of truth arrived, the musicians' reaction greatly surprised Speer. Many had changed their minds in recent days, because they did not want to abandon their families, or were afraid of being caught fleeing and executed. Thus, when the decision to be adopted was put to a vote that night, the majority decision was to remain in Berlin. Finally, only a few dared to take advantage of the opportunity that Speer offered them, and they were able to leave Berlin that night. Among them were Taxner and his family. The battle for Berlin began on Monday, April 16, and many of those who remained had to fight in one way or another and ended up dying.